So welcome back, everyone. I hope you got a good break and also took the time to uh, network, which is, I think, the item in the feedback that is uh, rated the highest uh, every year. Uh, so do that, of course, and take the time. Uh, for our next session, you see we have uh, our friends from uh, BL Smelters here, and we had an open invitation for some years, uh, but it took really brave man to come here and take it. And it's Janne Jansson uh, from the BL Smelters Digitalization Automation Team, who will share a bit more on what's happening over there. So please welcome Janne. Jump. Excellent. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I don't know, Marcus, you'll see soon enough if it was a good idea to take the first guy who says yes to present something. Yes, yeah, like, like said, I'm here to talk about uh, what we have been doing on the business area smelter side in the digitalization uh, during the last year, you could say. And here you can see a duck. Yes, you might wonder what has a duck to do with digitalization. This is actually an um, analogy I heard Mikael Staffas used when he described or, or summarized some of our strategic progress in this area. And I, li I, I like the analogy so much that I, I thought that I'd share it. It's a little bit different from, from the iceberg analogy, but in, in a sense the same. You know, ducks, they look cool, calm, happy, they swim quite slowly. But there could be a lot of things happening underneath the surface. There's a lot of paddling going, probably the, the small fish are biting the feet and, and uh, turbulence and, and all that. In a sense, uh, this is also good, I think, to, to frame my perspective in the presentation. So in this presentation, sorry, I will not go into the technical details. I will not go to those uh, things that are happening underneath the surface. You had some presentations on those those type of uh, items already, I'm focusing on the kind of well, bird's eye view on, on this. So the strategic level. And then what we have done on the strategic level thus far, in automation and digitalization, uh, we started this uh, strategy exploration last year. We identified the digitalization opportunities with our business units, summarized those also did like a quick gap analysis. What are the type of expertise or capabilities that we might be lacking when we start implementing digital solutions? Based on that, we refined uh, our objectives, strategic objectives early this year. Then we have gone through the kind of quick testing uh, of, of building scalable and reusable solutions by prioritizing these pilot cases for the 24 that we did in quarter two. And then we are now in the process of implementing the first, first of those pilots. And then the plan for the next year is, this, of course, learn from the pilots, adapt, and, and then go bigger, bigger with that. And the arrow here, uh, you can, uh, you can roughly use as a kind of agenda of my presentation as well. So I will start from how we refined the objectives, uh, how did we prioritize the cases, and then talk about the, where we are at the moment and what are we planning to do next. So our strategic objectives, we divide them for 25 and 2030, and then we have them separately for automation and digitalization. Uh, I guess all of you know that they're a little bit different topics, but quite often actually overlapping as well. So we keep them together, but look them a bit differently. In the automation side, uh, we focus on removing these uh, repetitive hazardous and, uh, and kind of unpleasant tasks. And uh, for 25, we have identified these five focus areas, tapping, casting, electrode handling, crane and forklift control work, that we want to automate half of that in all of our smelters. So this is 
across all the smelters. Some of the smelters are actually very much up to 100%, you could say, in some of the areas, and some others have a little bit more to do on this area. And in automation side, the idea is just to do more of that, increase the automation in those focus areas, and say that by 2030 we want that our smelters are operated during normal conditions fully without these repetitive hazardous or unpleasant tasks. So this is where the potential for automation is usually highest, and we know that the technology exists also to do so. On the digitalization side, we talk about shareable or reusable components, building things more together, uh, not reinventing the wheel all the time. You know, code is quite straightforward to copy and multiply. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to, to have our portfolios, our project portfolios, managed more systematically together with the business area, business units and the IT. So collaboration and, and also thinking what we are planning to do in the, in the future and then developing the solutions together. We've also wanted to put a measurable uh, KPI so we say that we want to reach a state by the end of 25 where we can say that our digitalization solutions are providing this business value of 10 million sec per year. And for 2030, there are things uh, we just want to increase. Uh, portfolio management, get better in that, share the ideas, build together, also design the things together, follow the enterprise architecture, solution architecture and data architecture. And probably we will need partners to do that as well. So we will need to introduce some ecosystem management systematic way to, to communicate with our partners. And by 2030, we want to say that every business decision we do is based on high quality, accurate, reliable data. And extrapolate the business value up to 100 million sec annually. So, uh, after the summer this year, we started the, the kind of drafting the ideas for the pilots. We wanted to have cases that are straightforward, simple to start, uh, things that would still be usable at many of our smelters, but would not hit those bottlenecks that we identified in the exploration study. So, for example, we realized that the, our process experts, they are really tight on their time. Same for the maintenance. So if we would start a quick pilot with the assumption of getting a lot of time from the like operators or process engineers, we would likely uh, not be able to do those quickly. So we wanted to start small. We came up with a list of six cases originally. You might wonder why there is now seven, because the seventh was actually invented during uh, when we got the use case ID number three done. And this is actually a good example of, of uh, collaboration between the smelters and mines that is happening today already. We started talking about IoT sensors, then we heard that, hey, there is a guy called Frederick at the mines who might be able to tell us something. Frederick shared exactly what Martin and you were talking, that uh, actually there's a way to use LoRaWAN sensors. We have a platform already for that, so that, that's excellent. We have, the, we have the kind of blueprint, we have the architecture for that now. So now the next step there is actually to start testing that at the smelters for environmental monitoring. Uh, of course, when we prioritize the cases, we wanted to evaluate uh, what is the impact of the case and on how easy they are to implement. So, this is a quick way to prioritize the cases. We slam them there, and then you can guess that we want to focus on the things that are easy to implement and provide significant or at least noticeable business impact. Here, of course, when we, like I said, we identified the cases so that we want to have quick, small cases that don't touch those process areas or maintenance areas. So. That's where the biggest potential usually is, so uh, it's not a surprise that in, in this, everything is actually on that lower right-hand corner of the, of the scale. Here's one example of the case that we are now doing. 
This is also in collaboration uh, with the data and analytics team. We have also an external partner supporting us in this, but the idea is to build uh, a machine vision solution based on what we have learned, for example, from the boulder detection case. Uh, this is uh, called ladle identification. So on the left, you can see those ladles. We have some 120 of those in Rönnshär, 270 or something like that in Harjavalta. And they are used to transport molten metal. Very big ones, I, I guess hard to tell from the, the picture, but uh, from the picture on the right is, is from the truck that is used in, in Rönnshär to transport those ladles. So you get the scale a bit uh, from that. They are huge. And of course we want that molten metal, which is over 1300 degrees warm or hot, you could say even. Uh, we want to have it inside the ladle. So the ladles are inspected in Rönnshär once a year. Uh, I guess Harjavalta follows the same approach. Uh, and when the ladle truck operator, the driver, picks up the ladle, we want to make sure that that ladle has been inspected, that there's no leaks, someone has really ensured that it's, it's safe to use. Uh, there is a possibility that, that all the ladles, you can see there's an ID in the ladle. They are unique, unique identifiers on those, but uh, there is a possibility of human error. You're in a rush, it might be a night shift, your last ladle that you pick, you don't want to drive to the furthest one uh, that is on the other side of the site. You might pick the first one and just take it in and then say that that's good. Uh, that's probably not good if, if the ladle has, been not, has not been inspected. That can cause, like, uh, for example, burn the whole ladle truck. I think those cost some two million euros or, or something like that to replace. So we want to reduce the human error by identifying that ladle that, hey, did the operator pick the right ladle that was assigned for picking in the transportation order? The tricky part here is, is that, that, of course, the machine vision solution needs to be quite quick, but it also needs to be low maintenance, uh, really cheap to use, because the business case is not, we are not talking about huge business value, we're reducing the human error. But it's a good, good case to test. We are using quite modern technology, and, and we're using are planning to use the same solution at, at both Rönnshär and Anharjavalta, so we're testing the ways of working with this. Some of the observations, uh, of course, we have learned already something during these pilots. Uh, we've talked already that business must come first. I agree that that's the thing that ensures that we do great things. It would be so nice to go out there and say that, hey, I want to use Gen AI, but what do you use it for? We need to have the business case. I've also noticed that it, it's not trivial to implement these scalable solutions at Pool Eden. We have very, very, at least at the smelter side, we have very fragmented architecture. Kind of every site has a little bit different DCS system and a little bit different IT systems and such. So it, it is not, not trivial to build something that can be used at, at many sites. Also, we have different business processes. We have Different sites have different partners that they have used before, so we might need to do some compromises there as well, and so forth. And of course, when you introduce more organizations, you get more requirements. It, it gets trickier to find the kind of right compromises. I've also noticed that uh, our internal processes are a bit suboptimal, I would say, for this agile development. It's not easy to come up with an idea and start building something the next day. Uh, we need to consider things like budget, long-term plans, and, and, and of course organizational availability between different, different teams. So let's say I need some support from Anton. Anton might have something on his desk for the next half a year. Uh, so that, that's something we could probably improve. Now th this, is, this is one thing that I've noted actually quite recently. I think we are getting quite good in, in sharing the results when we have built something like like I guess one example is, is is from this event that now I was invited to hear what you have been doing uh, also I'm sharing a bit what we are doing uh, but we could still be more proactive in sharing the ideas when when they are just ideas uh, I guess when when there's diversity in the team evaluating those different ideas 
we might see them a bit differently and, and might actually come up with a better solution together. So don't be afraid to share also the kind of ideas, even, the, even though when they are just ideas, not, not kind of completed projects. I think that's something we could do. There was also discussion on, on this uh, uh, taking the end users into consideration. Uh, that's something we should definitely improve in. It's something you can never do too much, I think. Consider who are the users or the, the people impacted by these solutions, involve them early on, and then design the solution based on their requirements and their expectations. Yes, and I guess all of this can be summarized that there's quite a lot of things to do still, which is also, of course, good. Well, the world is never complete. I think there's something wrong with the... Yes, here we go. Uh, some of the next steps for, for the end of this year and then for the next year, like I said, first of all, we do those pilots. We need to learn and, and then adjust our, our approach and then uh, go from there. On the aut automation side, actually, autonomous cranes and vehicles, that's a thing that we are looking, really looking forward to improving on. There is uh, some collaboration happening between at least myself and, and I've learned a lot from what you guys have been doing at the mines side uh, in terms of, for example, safety considerations at ITIC when introducing these autonomous ma machines there. Of course, interesting thing to follow up is the regulation on artificial intelligence in, in EU level and, and the whole generative AI space. I, I think, like someone mentioned already, the hype, the, the gen AI in the hype cycle is getting to the, to the kind of realized expectations or real expectations level. So I think we are starting to see some development there quite soon. It's not just the bus anymore. Regarding the autonomous machines, I guess there's a lot of interesting development ongoing on the safety regulation side in EU. EU and I published this uh, uh, regulation on, uh, on autonomous machines last summer, last year's summer. And I think the transition period for that was something like three and a half years. So we are going to see some standardization work follow up on that now, and that will hopefully improve our kind of capabilities to use these autonomous vehicles as well. We will have standards to follow instead of trying to figure out what to do next. You might remember that I had in those objectives, those business values defined for the digitalization solutions. So of course we need to, <laughs> we need to define the business value tracking process as well. Uh, that's something we need to start discussions on. How do we measure the business value provided by the the digitalization solutions. And then last but not least, of course, implement those use cases that, that we plan to reach the 10 million sec uh, business value by at the end of next year. So, Some of the sneak peeks, now this is the part sharing the ideas. These are just ideas. Uh, I don't have a budget for this yet. Uh, there, it looks promising, but uh, I think there's cases that all of you can help us uh, in next year. First of the cases that we're thinking about uh, is this intelligent process parameter recommendations. So using AI to harvest our process data that we have a lot uh, to identify the optimal operating windows and then suggest the process operators that, hey, it seems that you're a little bit perhaps off from the optimal window, you could try to do these actions to move there. This case has uh, some is it 20 million sec per year estimated business value in, in Kokkola and Harjavalta alone. So even if we get that done, that'd be good. Another case is a little bit the same, but for the maintenance. So here we want to follow the equipment, the main assets, and, and try to predict their failures or, or when they are starting to operate in a suboptimal condition. This, of course, requires data also, not just from our process control systems, but most likely maintenance systems uh, might need some, some kind of uh, data from manuals, 
work orders and, and such. Really interesting area. This has also, we estimated that the business value of, of this would be in, in the ballpark of 10 million sec a year, and, and we could get that alone from Rönnshare. So huge potential there, but not trivial to do. Third case is what we call control tower. Uh, we are not going to build a tower. That, that's what I, I was told. I was a little bit disappointed about that. But uh, uh, the, this case is about giving our central planners uh, the most data possible so that they can make the kind of critical business decisions. For example, where should this ship take the concentrate next? Should it go to Rönnshare or should it go to Kokkola? Taking data like weather forecasts, uh, the ship's location, uh, what is the kind of warehouse or inventory management systems that telling us about Kokkola's concentrate storage at, at the moment and such. At the moment, uh, this requires a lot of collaboration between different organizations. There's, I don't know how many Excels, but Excel seems to be the, the master tool for this today. Uh, we hope to improve that as well. Yes, and then lastly, I, I wanted to end the, the presentation on, on this another nice analogy uh, that is quite often used to describe change or, or transformation. I don't know, you might, some of you might recognize this guy. Anyone? Hemingway, yes. Ernst Hemingway, uh, he wrote a book in the in year 1926, I believe, the sun also rises. And, and in the book, there is uh, two guys talking. And the first guy asks from the other that, how did you go bankrupt? And the other, other one answers that two ways, gradually, then suddenly. So I guess that, that, that's a good kind of analogy that can be used to describe change in general. Things happen like small pops, Niklas was using that, that he likes change happen like popcorn, some like Big Bang. I, I think they both actually happen. First it's small pops and then boom. And it's a good analogy we can also use in the digitalization transformation, I think, that, that it seems that we are moving quite slow, at least to me and, and I guess to, to many of you as well. But I'm really sure that when after, let's say in, in five years, we look back what we have reached and achieved, it will look significant, actually. It's really interesting time to, to live, uh, to be part of this digitalization trend, see how things like Gen AI, autonomous machines, can help us in, in there. And, and uh, I'm sure that we can make great things happen if we do it together. Thanks. Wonderful. Well done, Yanni. Uh, thank you. We have the questions now. We, yeah, we have. We have time for one question, and uh, I take the cube again and just see if there is someone with a question. Is it? You can turn on my microphone. Oh, you have a question. So <laughs> you, here you go. Okay. Uh, you talked about asset monitoring there. So would you say it's a good plan to just do that on all of your assets or kind of categorize them? Like some could be utilized for uh, IoT and some are more, let's call it regular maintenance. What are your thoughts on that? Of, of course, for the next year, we cannot do asset management or predictive maintenance for all of our assets at all of the smelters. So we need to be wise. We need to pick kind of two sites, uh, the most promising assets that would be likely as, as mutually common as possible, or at least that the same kind of approach could be used for both. And then we carry out the exercise on that, and, and then we build from there. I guess quite often what you do in the asset management space when you start this kind of condition monitoring and, and predictive maintenance, you do this criticality analysis of your assets. You, you see how much they impact uh, your production, do you have redundancy in them and, and such. And based on that, you pick the kind of highest potential and start from there. So not go big bang in there, definitely no. It, it, otherwise, it would be a big project and take us many years. 
Thank you. Uh, time for another quick question, if we have. Otherwise, Jan is around. Stefan, here you go. A uh, question about the optimization of the quaint. Uh, is it a technical issue or is it a change management issue in the organization? I can say it's definitely not a technical issue. There is uh, what I've been told by the crane providers, there's some details that are trickier to automate at this stage. So that would be like uh, some kind of steps in the work process. That, that, that's not a big thing. That the most challenging thing is to actually have the autonomous machines operating together with humans safely. Uh, also, I guess it's part of the change management as well, get the operators accept the autonomous machines, uh, but also make it so that it's still safe for them to be there when needed. So it's a safety related concern that, that, that I have. And there, there is some promising development in the instrumentation side as well, and standardization side. Uh, there is SIL certified uh, tracking sensors in, in the progress. I've understood that it will take a few years, but then we could actually have kind of automated way to, to machine to identify a person on its way. And, and then it would not be an, even a safety risk anymore to have those. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Round of applause.